Uh, my name is Tom Leonard. I'm a relatively new arrival to the city of Saginaw. Uh, I teach in schools and I'm also created about two and a half years ago a project called the Great Lakes Odyssey World. And part of that is this evening we're doing the Great Lakes Odyssey Radio Hour. Uh, it's broadcast in Toronto, Buffalo this evening and also Central Michigan University. Tonight's broadcast is going to be featuring Peter Frank Pan, the author of a book that talks about the history of climate, the Earth Transformed. Uh, he's an Oxford scholar, incredible, lucid writer. So you get it, and it also be, will be interspersed with some innovative jazz. So if you like guys like that at all, um, the Great Lakes Odyssey world is trying to connect people to the Great Lakes. So much of our Great Lakes focus is science-based, and it's all got its little silos. But we're trying to make that broader connection to people, the passion. And I can't think of anyone better who's made that connection, that passion to place, than Sally Colmish, which we'll be talking about this evening. So, and I just want to say that place-based attitude goes back in my early life when I used to go up to Forest, Ontario. My father's Canadian. And I, I was, I, I had problems as a child. I was not able to read very well, but that, that, being on the lake gave me that special solace and, and sense of place. And uh, I can't think again, I just want to hand it over to Sally in talking about her book that reflects that probably better than anything I can say at this point. So go ahead, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, is that the Great Lake Odyssey uh, radio hour on WCMU? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is. And it's also in Buffalo. The, 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 tonight's broadcast on CMU is at 10 o'clock. But if you want to go on to Tor uh, Buffalo, Toronto, uh, public media, that's at 7 o'clock if you're a, a okay. little bit of an earlier uh, person. But yeah, absolutely. And we have 10 out. We, we're doing our second season. So uh, really fun stuff. We really look forward. And we just had Guido join us, and we expect Marquette to join us on that market as well. But again, Sally, if you will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Hello. 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 Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I want to first thank Tom, as well as Maria McCarville and Lynn Heitkamp from the Public Libraries of Saginaw for helping to organize this and put it on today. And I want to thank all of you especially for taking your Saturday afternoon to come and talk and hear about um, our best part of us and our connections with nature and the precious Great Lakes. What I'd like to do today is just briefly share some insights and experiences in my career that led to writing this novel and a bit about that writing process that will hopefully lay the groundwork for our conversation today. Hearing from all of you about reading the book and all of the book clubs that I've done so far has really been the best part of writing this novel and so I'm looking forward to talking with all of you. So. To start, I'd like to look, think about what is the best parts of us? <laughs> Who makes up the best parts of us? Do the people we live with, that we live life with, do they contribute to who we are? Of course, right? What about the places we live in or experience on vacations, perhaps our homes, our family cottages, by lakes or in woods? Have they helped to form who all of you are? What about the trees or plants that live in your yard or in your community? Are we connected with them or are we separate entities living around us but not part of us? When I started thinking about the storyline for the best part of us, I knew I wanted to write a book about a young girl and her family with deep connections to nature through their summer cottage, since so many of us in Michigan are fortunate enough to to have or visit places like that. And I wanted this to really think about what happens when that part of their life, that part of themselves, is taken away from them. What are the consequences of not being at a place that's a part of you, that makes you truly who you are, that's a sense of your own soul? So, in order to tell you why this book was so important for me to write, I'd like to backtrack just a little bit. I have been a journalist and environmental communicator my entire life. And that goes back many years. 
to when we first started to realize about the role of, that we and the impact we were having on our environment. The levels of pollution in our air, water, and soil were so high that we thought as communicators that we had to hammer home all of the horrible ways that we were destroying the planet. And while that negative attention and forcefulness in our messaging resulted in new laws and regulations that helped how industries and municipalities change their practices, over time we realized that that overwhelming and sometimes terrifying information was not doing anything to help people to change their behaviors or take action to protect the environment. So we studied different communication patterns for other issues to identify what works to encourage individual interest, commitment, and action. What, we've might, what we found might sound obvious to you, but at the time it was a true game changer for the environmental communications area. What we value, we act to protect. So our children, our families, our friends, perhaps even our jobs, we'll do just about everything to protect them, right? So how could we help recognize, people to recognize the role and value that nature and environment has in their life? Well, we decided the first step was to focus on getting people outside because the physical and psychological benefits of spending time in nature are really now well documented. More broadly, these same studies tell us that nature also helps us to form and be the best part of ourselves. So, if I asked you to just take a deep breath and imagine the fragrance of flowers and pine trees, the sound of rushing creeks and breaking waves, or the sight of a flutter of monarch butterflies floating by, do you feel your breath calming and your heart relaxing? Whether you recognize it or not, your body is likely responding just that way. And if picturing images of the natural world alone helps us to relax, imagine what a walk in the woods or visiting a lake or ocean can do for us. Given that most of us seek refuge on our vacation in natural spaces, family cottages, or even national parks. We recognize this at some level, right? But in our average daily lives, the average American spends 7% of our daily life outdoors. And that is usually taken up by driving in our cars, walking in and out of our jobs or out of stores, and attending school. Not the type of interaction with nature that we need to have those psychological and health benefits. So more than a thousand studies <coughs> over the past 40 years back up the need for and benefits of, work, of being in nature. Time spent in, our, in near green space lowers our blood pressure and stress hormone levels, reduces anxiety and feelings of isolation, and improves mood and cognitive function. Studies have also found that participants who viewed various nature scenes experienced elevated feelings of affection, playfulness, and friendliness, as well as hyper brain alpha waves, which is associated with increased serotonin production. Those who viewed pictures of urban buildings and streets experienced feelings of sadness, boredom, and tension. For classrooms and cafeterias, I think of all, in our neighborhood, all of our schools are being redone, right? Not only for safety features, but also for you know increases size and update technology and everything. I'm amazed to see that so few of them have windows outside that students can really see the natural world around them and have trees and plants outside. Because studies have proven that classrooms and cafeterias in schools that include used to green vegetation, such as trees and shrubs, are significant factors in students' increased academic performances on standardized tests, graduation rates, and as well as future college attendance. In hospitals, patients who have an unobstructed view of nature 
or even have potted plants in their rooms, report higher and faster levels of renewed health, significantly lower use of pain medication, lower blood pressure and heart rates, and fewer post-surgical complaints. And the one I found most amazing is when students with hyperactivity or attention deficit disorder participate in outdoor activities, Researchers found that their symptoms, as well as their levels of anxiety and aggression, decrease while their cognitive function improves, matching that reported for the two top-selling ADHD medications. Mm -hmm. So when we have a chance to get out into nature near our homes, the findings are even more significant. Researchers in the Netherlands and United Kingdom found the lowest incidences of 15 of the top 24 diseases or early death among residents with green space within a half mile from home. And green space is a great equalizer found to benefit residents of all economic levels as well as increasing community cohesion and reducing crime. And it doesn't take, sorry, okay, doesn't take much time only 120 minutes or two hours in nature, all at once or scattered over the course of the week, are proven to give us what we need from nature to see those benefits throughout that week. Two hours, that's it. And we've also discovered that nature shares specific chemicals or ions, energy, with us. When we walk in the woods, for example, we inhale phytoncides which trees actually emit all the time to protect themselves and each other from germs and diseases. Those chemicals can elevate our own immune systems, disease-fighting cells, reduce stress, lower blood sugar, diminish pain, <coughs> heighten concentration, improve sleep, and how we respond to stress. If you've ever wondered why you can sit on a beach or by water for long periods, credit negative ions or charged molecules, which we can't feel, see, taste, or hear, but are found in abundance near moving water and in the mountains. Studies show that these ions act as a natural antidepressant by lowering blood tests, blood lactate levels, and improving our metabolism by enhancing blood flow. So once we make the commitment to find those 120 minutes per week to be in nature, whether it's through walks in the park or forest to visit the local lake or stream, or simply gardening in your own backyard, the benefits multiply. A 2005 study reported in the Journal of Health Psychology that higher scores of connectivity with nature enhances a person's overall psychological well-being a sense of involvement in something larger than ourselves, an interest in environmental information, and a commitment to act in ways that sustain the planet. So, and I want to tell you, just all of these pictures are all taken from the Great Lakes region. So, I hope you're enjoying them. If simply being around and in nature causes our physical and emotional health to improve to these degrees, surely we are as connected with nature as we are to our family and friends. Mother Nature shares its energies with us since we are part of the natural world, that it provides so much to us in spite of how we've treated her is really truly an amazing gift. Our science and policies have started to reflect this connection. In our Great Lakes region, US and Canadian policymakers reflected these findings by including a commitment in their agreements to restore and protect the lakes. It's called the ecosystem approach. This approach recognizes that every part of the Great Lakes ecosystem, including humans, are interconnected and must be considered together as they approach cleanup and protection efforts around the region. One of our top Great Lakes scientists, Dr. John Hardy, who I know the Great Lakes Policy Series had a speaker before, summarized it perfectly when he wrote that the difference between an environment and ecosystem is like the difference between a house and a home. A house is something that's external and detached, sits across the street or down the block. A home, in contrast, is something we see ourselves in 
even when we're not there. <clears throat> I couldn't talk today without talking about something about the Great Lakes watershed, given that I've devoted my entire life to those lakes. And we're so fortunate to live in a place that is shaped by our precious Great Lakes. The immense size of the lakes and the St. Lawrence River and their value to Canada and the United States are hard to imagine, even though for those of us who live in the region. <clears throat> The lakes hold more than 20% of the Earth's fresh surface water, or six quadrillion gallons, like we could possibly imagine that. <laughs> they cover a total area of more than 95,000 square miles, and with the St. Lawrence River span almost half of the North American continent. The watershed is one of the world's most diverse, with more than 3,500 species of plants and wildlife, and more than 250 species of fish. Up to 40 million residents draw their drinking water from the lakes and food from the 37% of land that's devoted to agriculture. The Great Lakes and their natural resources obviously have provided the foundation for economies of both countries for centuries. Now we know that more than 200 million tons of cargo are transported every year which contributes 293,000 jobs and $17.3 billion to our region's economy. Another 14 billion is created every year through tourism and, and <laughs> recreation, particularly in communities along the lake's coastline. The eight states and two provinces surrounding the Great Lakes region were a separate country. Its economy would be the third largest in the world behind the United States and China. Third largest in the world. Pretty amazing what we provide to both countries, isn't it? From virtually every perspective, social, economic, recreational, environmental, and aesthetics, it's impossible to overstate the vital link between the health of the lakes and our own health and viability. In our state alone, we have 11,000 in the lakes more freshwater shoreline than any state in the country, and tens of thousands of miles of rivers and streams to enjoy. So let's veer to the book and say that I've spent the majority of my career relaying any of these statistics to anyone and everyone who would listen, so that we can share the science and the policies and the actions that will ensure that our precious Great Lakes are restored and protected. And as satisfying as that career has been, I started to wonder if I could transfer my writing skills to something that might focus on the value of nature and the Great Lakes. How could I reach a broader audience, help readers to understand the vital role of lives and the beauty of our region? After all, how many novels have you read that are based in the Great Lakes? My goals were simple, yet immense, for a debut author. I wanted to write a novel where nature is as much a character <coughs> as the people in it and inspires readers to remember and reconnect with places that they hold dear. I wanted to focus on the setting's details to immerse readers in the, in the region's natural beauty, breadth, and personalities. Like all spectacular novels, <laughs> being a little optimistic there, I hope readers would be absorbed into the setting and the story and connect with the characters. So I wanted to create a multi-generational family who has deep bonds with each other and their island and lake, who each act with the best of intentions, but that result in the worst of outcomes. You can tell who's read the book. <laughs> and those outcomes force each member to respond according to his or her own sense of self and who and what they want to be loyal to. It's a true coming of age story, no matter the character's age, where she or he must discover what is most valuable to them personally. And I wanted to write a story that provides hopefulness that we can always choose to change our perspectives and lives to be who, what, and where we are meant to be. That when we're loyal to our own connections and values is when we find the best part of ourselves. Luckily, 
I found the Stanford University Fiction Program. It was an intensive remote learning sequence of courses that taught 45 students from eight countries all about plot, characterization, setting, editing, and much more over three years. When I graduated, I had a rough draft, rough first draft, I should say, of the best part of us. It took two more years, a lot of research, and 11 more drafts before I felt comfortable sending it out to various publishers. Through the program, I learned that it was important to pick one element of a story, the setting, character, or plot, to familiar, that really is familiar to the author to ground the story. So setting was an obvious choice, right? <laughs> I consider myself incredibly lucky to have been able to spend so much time in our region's gorgeous lake of lakes and woods, which are the experiences I use to create the family's lake, islands, and forests. So when I first thought about who should be in Beth's family, I wanted to include three generations for the very, very dynamics of discipline and attention that occur between and among them. I also considered each character in terms of their innate level of connection with nature. Just a minute, I get to <laughs> give you time to read this. So you can see Ojibwe, Ben, Dylan, and Beth are on one end of the spectrum, those people who are really connected to nature. Evan, Ty, and Nina kind of in the middle, and Megan and Kate over to the right. So I wanted to think about how would that connection with nature drive their thoughts, their motivations, and actions throughout the story, as well as their perspectives towards each other. How might each character come of age over the course of the story in terms of what and who they are loyal to? And how does that conflict with other family members' viewpoints and priorities? Will they consider their actions and learn from them over time? <coughs> or will they stay firmly rooted in their own perspectives? These three elements for each character provided plenty of opportunity for complex sibling and parent dynamics. Beyond that outline, however, Beth and the other characters took over the story early in the writing process, which was an exhilarating and very odd sensation <laughs> after my many years of writing factual, uh, factual based writing. I'll give you one quick example. One of my Stanford's assignments was a free writing exercise where each primary character writes a letter to me, starting with the phrase, there's something you don't know about me. I completed thorough biographies and character arcs and setting prompts for each character before doing the exercises, so I thought I knew them well enough to start writing the novel story. <coughs> I still remember the odd sensation of sitting in my local library, closing my eyes, and letting the words spill onto my computer screen for 11 hours, mm -hmm. as long as the library was open. I didn't have a clue of what most of the characters were writing. And none of them, none of them, followed the plot outline I had written. <laughs> so the process spilled over to writing the story itself. Each time, I focused on listening to the characters rather than controlling the narrative. They and the story deepened. Many times, I'd sit down to write at night after work, expecting to write a scene a certain way, and something entirely different was the result. Eventually, I learned to think of the scenes as, as puzzle pieces, and by the 10th draft, I could see how the various storylines wove together into a united story. That's when I let myself go back and read those letters. And <coughs> the story was true to every character's message, which was pretty amazing for me. <laughs> this is all coming out of my head, and yet I don't, I just have to follow along, right? So in my work, I've had the good fortune to work with members of several US tribes and Canadian First Nations, and to learn about the Ojibwe or Anishinaabe's culture which has a very deep spiritual philosophy connected with nature. Because of these traditions, and because they have lived for centuries in the part of Ontario where this novel is based, 
I couldn't imagine writing this novel without them. By doing so, I was also able to contrast with best immigrant grandparents, Ty and Nina, who represent the more patrician or Anglo-Saxon viewpoint <coughs> toward nature. They love the lake and island for their similarities to Wales, and they enjoy being there with their family. But Ty builds his cabin and trails to the top of Lindy's Peak as a way to own versus revere the land. They don't spend much time deep in nature as do Beth, Dylan, and Ben. Yet even with this different perspective, they have a deep emotional connection to the island because of their own family member memories, traditions, and experiences <coughs> while they're there. So each side of the conflict has justifiable reasons for wanting or believing the island should belong to them. So there's a lot more that I can say about researching and writing the best part of us. But I'm eager to hear from all of you and answer your questions about the story or anything else you'd like to discuss. In conversations with, oops, with more than 65 book clubs and audiences like this, it's been great fun to hear readers talk about the novel setting and how it connects them to their own special places in nature, which characters they fell in love with, and maybe some they didn't. Um, and especially the plot surprises, which I know garner a lot of different perspectives. So each of us reads from our own perspective, and I'm excited to hear yours. And if you haven't read the novel yet, I hope our conversation today <coughs> excites you to read that story. So let's open this up. I have a few more comments, but let's open this up. I'd love to hear from all of you, answer any questions, and I know your book club has read the book, so happy to have anyone start off. Um, you chose w uh, Wales as a you know the country that Taylor came from. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular reason for that, or just um, two reasons? I started out thinking about where all of us have, all the countries we've learned about through our own history, as history lessons and everything in school. And I thought, okay, we've all learned about France, we've all learned about Germany, we've learned about England, whatever. And so I thought, okay, what about a smaller country? And I, I Googled um, countries with a good connection to nature. And Wales came up. And when you actually look at a lot of their history and their traditions, it's very much based on um, the role of nature in their lives. Um, they, for example, when you see in the story when Ty is celebrating Lama's Day, it's about the harvest. It's a huge uh, celebration still in Wales. And so it had connections and similarities to the Ojibwe tradition, and yet, very much from the Anglo-Saxon perspective versus thinking of us as part of nature and that nature is leading the way, which is the way of Jim White feels. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone have a, uh -huh. Well, I enjoyed the book because of a personal connection that you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, my family, thanks to my grandpa, has had a cottage, a log cabin in the woods on a small lake near uh, Boyne Falls, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a huge part of our family history and our connections there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just blessed to have it. And so I really, that part of your story really resonated with me. Good, good. 